What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises and delivers the best guests in all of true crime. And tonight, it's where our true crime genesis all began with the Dan Markell murder case. I'm going to quickly mute these guys as I go through this. Um, if you guys can mute yourselves, that'd be great. Um, so we are diving back into the Dan Markell murder case and are asking the question, could other Adelsons, remember the Adelson family, be indicted as Charlie's trial is pushed back to fall 2023? One career military lawyer who spent time litigating as a civilian too and is a bright legal mind believes there are at least 125 reasons right now why Wendy Adelson could be charged. Our best guests are here to break it all down. We've got Lieutenant Colonel Retired Carl Steinbeck. He's a nearly 30-year judge advocate for the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General Corps, 23 years active duty, now zealously representing military service members and DOD, Department of Defense, civilian employees across the globe and fighting for their justice matters through his law firm, which bears his name, the Steinbeck Law Firm. His vast trial experience includes seven years in capacities as an assistant criminal district attorney, state public defender, and private practitioner. Then a face that's familiar to everyone, famed Tallahassee defense attorney R. Timothy Jansen. He is a partner in the firm that also bears his name, Jansen and Davis. He's handled complex civil, administrative, and criminal litigation, and he spent five years as a federal prosecutor. No one, and I underscore that, knows the Tallahassee legal community better than Tim. And last but certainly not least, John Singer is co-founder of Singer Deutsch LLP. They've all got firms with their names in it. And he is a graduate of the Georgetown Law School, not a shabby place to go to law school. He has been named a super lawyer every year that you can count to the beginning of time and makes regular appearances on channels like CNBC and others regularly. A quick Note, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We are at Podcast STS. You can also listen. You don't have to watch, but you can listen anywhere you find podcasts. Please support us on Patreon. You can become a YouTube member. Please subscribe and like. And check out survivingthesurvivor.com. My chief marketing officer, my wife, is currently building our merch store. It's going to be up and running soon. So, for those of you who do not know, and this is the case that I uh, said it all began with Dan Markell, a quick summary. Charlie Adelson is the accused ringleader in the 2014 murder for hire of Florida State law pr professor Dan Markell. Two hitmen were tried and convicted along with a middle woman, Katie Magbanawa. In what will be more than nine years since the savage murder, Charlie Adelson is set to go on trial this fall. But will other members of the Adelson family be charged like Dan Markell's ex-wife, Wendy, or his ex-mother-in-law, Donna? One of our guests says there's certainly enough to bring charges against Wendy. Charlie, meanwhile, remains in solitary confinement in the Leon County Jail, where he has been since his arrest last April. I cannot believe it has almost been a year that he's been sitting in that jail. John Singer, I'm going to have you uh, lead us out of the gates here. You made a prediction a while back that this Magbanawa, Katie Magbanawa, the middle woman in all this, uh, there was talk of a proffer. She was shipped back to Leon County from the state prison. Uh, all we know right now is it remains sealed, that proffer. Um, but you believe it to be uh, a nothing burger. Do you still feel that way? Unmute yourself, sir. That's my fault. You do that. You are unmuted. I'm unmuted. You can hear me. Yes. Um, I, I thought from the beginning that it would be a nothing burger in the sense that if there were a time for Katie to speak, it certainly would have been prior to the second trial. There, there's an overwhelming com, uh, conviction rate when you try someone again for the same charges. And I think the first time they tried her in 19, it was 10 to 2 or 11 to 1 or thereabouts in favor of guilty. The state has the overwhelming um, advantage in the second trial. They learned from their mistakes much more than the defense does. There were jurors who gave interviews on other YouTube channels um, indicating 
what the flaws in the prosecution were and the prosecution fixed that. So the time for her to um, make hay, if you would, with the prosecutors would have been in May of 2022 before her retrial. So I always believe that when that time came and went and she took the stand and she went on trial for the second go around, that she didn't have much to offer. She may have had um, oral uh, things to tell the prosecution without receipts, if you will. But after two trials and her getting up there and perjuring herself twice, she had no credibility. Um, I don't put a lot of stock in what Rochbaum said um, in the last uh, hearing last week, where he said that um, there wasn't much in there or if anything to incriminate Charlie. But, um, you know, and, and again, the judge said beauty is in the eye of the beholder, essentially, and that there's different interpretations. But he made a, a pretty broad comment that what she said didn't do much in the way of incriminating Charlie. So maybe there was a little there, but not enough. And at the end of the day, she's not getting a deal. She doesn't have the goods to offer on the Adelsons. I know that angers a lot of people who have been following this case. I know a lot of rabid followers were hoping that after a second trial, she would have the goods to get all of the Adelsons indicted. But I never believed that was going to come to fruition. And I'm, I'm at the same place now. Tim Jansen, if a, uh, if a proffer is really not much of anything, um, why seal it? Uh, let me unmute you. That's all my fault. There you go. They're sealing it out of the abundance of caution for a fair trial. I think they're really sealing it because they probably know that the state is not going to call her as a witness because her, she's damaged goods. And she may have put said some incriminating things on in their proffer, but they know that the state's probably not going to call her because they're going to make a mini trial of her committing perjury. And unless you can verify, like John said, she's she's damaged. She's not worth anything. So they don't want to be tainted or the jury pool to be tainted by any inference, anything that she says, and they can't cross-examine her. So I, I think that's right. I think he did the right thing by making sure no one hears what she said, because at this point she did a proffer. She had chances for immunity. So now to do a proffer, her lawyer had to convince her to say something, something that was going towards possibly getting out the, of the life sentence. So she probably implicated him without any credibility, without any uh, ability to, to have independent evidence corroborate what she's saying. So I would have done the same thing. I would have kept it out because Tallahassee is a small town. Everyone knows about this case. You don't want them saying, oh, she said this, but they didn't call her. He's getting damaged. And the jurors that want to sit on this case, they're not going to say they took that in consideration because everybody's going to want to sit on this case, all the community. And Tim, right back at you. We just wrapped up uh, the Alec Murdoch trial. You helped us tremendously on that. Uh, obviously, very high profile case, especially in the town of Walterboro, South Carolina. How will this compare uh, in a s relatively small but bigger town like Tallahassee once it gets going in April, this trial? Well, Tallahassee is a very educated community. You have three universities here. Um, you have state government here. Um, the crime was committed in one of the more affluent neighborhoods of Benton. So I have people who normally don't even consider talking about criminal cases. They're very concerned because they live in that neighborhood. Um you do have a lot of college kids that come and go, but remember these college kids, at least a law student, he was a faculty member. He's very well known. He was prestigious around the country in legal circles. So it's going to be followed. And there is kind of an interesting thing here about the wife getting away with it and the brother being charged. Definitely a fascinating case. Um, John Singer, to you, I'm going to give you a nice, easy question to start with from Lewis J.M. Why hasn't Donna been arrested yet, John Singer? I think that the prosecution has adhered to um, a similar playbook, which is, you know, in the Magmanua case, they waited, waited, waited until the bitter end before the essentially on the eve of the second trial in 22 to see if perhaps Katie would flip on Charlie to make the case a lot easier, even though we're all in accord that the case against Charlie is overwhelming and there's tremendous circumstantial and even now direct evidence via the Dolce Vita recording. 
But if Katie had provided them with the last piece of the puzzle, it would have been an even easier case. And when it became clear that on the cusp of that second trial, um, Katie wasn't going to flip, they then went ahead and indicted um, Charlie. I think the same thing's going to happen here. If we're on the precipice of Charlie's uh, trial, which looks like it's going to be in Q3 of 23, and Charlie hasn't flipped on his mother, which I think we're all on accord that he's not going to, then I think they very well could arrest Donna right before that. They just want to see if there's any shot at strengthening an even uh, an already very strong case by getting some corroborative testimony. But I think they're going to do the same thing they did with Charlie, with Donna. They're going to wait till the veritable eve of the trial and then bring Donna in and arrest her. Because quite frankly, the good the, the evidence against Donna is overwhelming. Wow. Interesting. Uh, Tim and Carl, first Tim, do you agree with that? Are we going to see another arrest before Charlie gets on the stand? Well, it kind of reminds me in federal court, your client gets indicted and then you're at first appearance and the agent and the AUSA is already asking if your guy wants to cooperate. I'll agree to give him bond. Um, I, I agree. They're very, George is very calculating and they're going to give this lawyer all the evidence to let him see what he's got. See if he's going to make it a reasonable decision to cooperate. If not, then they're going to play their cards how they think or benefit them. So I don't disagree that Donna may not be charged. I agree. There's certainly circumstantial evidence, strong circumstantial evidence to charge Donna. Um, and I, I think it might happen. I, I do agree with that. And Carl, how about yourself? Do you think we could see uh, someone in handcuffs prior to Charlie taking the stand? I totally agree with that. And my proposition is I also think Wendy will be indicted at the same time as Donna. Mm, I think strong evidence against both. Carl, doubling down there. And hello to John Singer's child. Love to see that. <laughs> My own kids popped in. I love it. She can join the fun. Um, Asian American Legal Focus. She is the uh, one of the godmothers of this case. Been following it for a very long time. If you don't know Judy Tang and her channel, mm -hmm. you better find out because she's got the goods on all things Dan Markell. Shout out to her. Uh, Jeannie Castellano writes right here. I'm excited for this one. Adelson haters in the house. I don't know if we want to put it that way. How about we're getting justice for Dan Markell? Shout out to everyone behind justice for Dan Markell, too. Uh, without further ado, and there was a lot of ado before this, uh, Carl, he is the man of the hour. He has put together basically 125 reasons. We're going to try to get to as many. <laughs> Obviously, within we're going to do a few shows on this. So maybe 20 points, maybe a few more uh, in that list of 100 plus reasons why he thinks Wendy could be indicted. Uh, Carl, have at it and feel free to ask questions, everyone. And Tim and John will respond in kind. All right. Well, I'll take these one at a time and then pause for comments. The first one I have um, has to do with Wendy's behavior the day of the murder. And uh, I, I should preface that by saying, for any type of case I'm looking to solve the who done it and what happened, I'm looking at what happened with the main characters leading up to the murder, what happened during the day of the murder, and then what also happened afterwards, because you'll see a lot of behavior lining up of consistencies and indicators of what happened and who's really guilty and who's not. So I use this kind of technique regardless of when I'm a prosecutor defense counsel. And so one of, I would say the strongest circumstantial piece of evidence against Wendy is her going to the crime scene for a crime scene inspection of sorts. And her going there an hour and 10 minutes roughly after Dan had two bullets to the head is very damning, I would say. And there also the reason being is she went out of her way to go there. And some of the other factors as well that led up to that show that she was very desperate to have something change in her life because the legalities of what Dan was uh, driving against her were about to be very serious and the consequences and, and life altering. So her going there, I believe, was the indicator that she wanted to find out had a hit actually happened. This thing was in the works back in June previously, if you recall the hitman. They said they'd go up there. They went an initial trip up there in the June trying to kill Dan. And then they came back a second time and there was a lot of pressure because they also were aware that Dan was leaving town on Saturday. So the hit happened on Friday the 18th of July in 2014. 
So for her to go there that short of time frame beforehand, and then um, and then use the excuse she was going to find some buy some bourbon rye liquor at a liquor store that she used to go to with Dan when they lived by the house. It was totally out of the way. It was more towards downtown Tallahassee, and she was also ha having previous lunch arrangements to meet with a couple friend of hers. So she was going to make this big loop around just to go to this ABC Liquor, calling it a shortcut. Yet if you look at the actual road that they used to live on, Trescott, where Dan and the kids still live, that Trescott Road doesn't have any um, uh, anything but a single lane each way. There's no parking spots even. And there's a lot of trees and bushes, and, and you don't have good visibility. And then there's tons of speed bumps all along there. And then you think of the fact that there's a lot of kids with families, um, families with kids, excuse me, and... So it's just not a safe thing to do is drive through there because you're going to have to go very slow and just makes zero sense to do that unless you knew something was happening. So I, just to I, recap, I that, Tim, I, real quick. So uh, yeah. basically, Carl's saying she drove to the crime scene about 70 minutes after uh, Dan received two bullets to the head um, way out of the way. Tim, you know that area. You live in Tallahassee. Uh, how is that for point one here? I think this is an excellent point. Very crucial in the case. I know that street because my wife, when we were dating, lived on that street. I've been to Markel's house. That liquor store she was going to was completely out of the way. Okay. And how is it really important? He's right. It has a bunch of speed bumps. It's a residential neighborhood. But more importantly, when Rivera was given his interview to the cops, to the FBI and to the cops, he said they called Mag Bonawa to say it's done. What did she say? I already know. Now, it was not put on any kind of, it wasn't even put out there yet. So the only way that she would have known that is if Wendy would have called her brother or someone to say, there's a bunch of cop cars there. That's the only way that Magbana would know that the murder had already taken place. Hey, Tim, this question is right back from Judy to you. Question for Tim Jansen. How did it work when his past client, Brian Winchester, gave a proffer? Was it made public immediately to the guest saying Charlie would try to cut a deal, given how tied he is? By the way, uh, John Singer, I've got you muted because a little funky noise coming off. So feel free to unmute yourself and mute yourself when you are speaking. But, Tim, that question is for you. So the Dan Winchester case was a high profile case. I mean, it was an 18 year old murder that had not been solved. He was charged with kidnapping his ex-spouse, who was the widow of the victim. Um, nobody knew about the proffer, nobody at all. It was kept secret. We went to the, we went to the scene and we showed him where the body was and nobody knew about that except the three kids on bicycles that were smoking pot and saw all the cop cars coming boy and they were pedaling as fast as they could, but it was kept secret. Nobody knew. And in fact, when Dan had his sentencing, the only people that knew that they had found the body was the prosecutor and myself. So we didn't have that issue of it coming out. And they did that for a reason because they wanted the, the wife to come in at sentencing and make a statement. So she came in and make a statement and she said, it's either his life or mine. And they were going to use all that information against her. And they indicted her shortly after. Um, YTH writes, hey, I'm from Team Fancy. Justice for Dan is coming. For those of you who do not know, Fancy Fiction with an I, like Wendy with an I, is uh, one of the OGs of all this as well. Her and Asian American Legal Focus. If you, if you have not seen Fancy Fiction stuff on YouTube, check her out. She's got all the wiretaps. She's in the weeds on this probably more than anyone out there. John, and then we'll get back to Carl. Carl will take nine hours the way I'm going right now, but we'll get go yeah. through it a little quicker. But, John, um, this notion that she drives by the house 70 minutes after the homicide uh, when it's way out of the way, um, proof that maybe she was uh, not had knowledge of this ahead of time. I mean, absolutely. The one This is one of the few things on the case I really can't opine on with any particularity because I don't know – the roads. I don't know what the, the fastest route would be. I don't know where ABC Liquors was in relation to uh, her house on Aqua Ridge. So I, I can't tell you how circuitous her route she took was, but accepting what um, has been said so far, 
it certainly is evidence of guilt, although I think there are other reasons posited um, in the list that, that are greater evidence of guilt than that. Um, but certainly that's, it. that's one piece of the puzzle, another indicia of her culpability. And uh, Angela writes, John, I want to mute, mute you back up. Angela writes, Tim Jansen in the house here, of course. Um, and Angela also writes, Carl Steinbeck. I haven't seen the John Singer one. I know it's coming. And a very special shout out to Katie Cool Lady, a friend of the show, a voice for victims. She writes, hello, everyone. Fancy, Judy, Angela. Um, Carl, next point. Um, thank you. Next point. All right, this this ties in with the first, and, and you could say it's it's right up there with it in terms of significance and, and showing uh, consciousness of guilt. And that's the fact that when she did drive on Trescott, she got within two or three houses of the, of the house that Dan and her kids were living in that morning, up till that morning when Dan was killed. So she knew her kids were doing an overnight there. And what does she do? She zips out of there. She completely takes off, doesn't even ask the police officers, what are these five squad cars doing in front of the house? What do you got crime scene tape there? When she testified, she says, oh, I thought it was some downed trees, despite the fact there's no storms in the area. And who has that many cop cars show up and no um, construction equipment? So that I thought she knew what was going on with her kids. She was expecting the hitmen to do the hit when the kids were in, in the daycare. And she was coming by to see what is taking so long and, and how they finally got it done right. So Benton runs parallel to Trescott. And if you turn on Trescott, you take a right from the direction she was coming. The house would have been the third house on the left. So if they blocked off Trescott and she was going down Benton, she would have driven right. And she would have seen all the cop cars at the house. No doubt. Jeannie Cassiano writes, Wendy is involved. Her little innuendo with the bullet whiskey then drives by Trescott with it in her back seat, followed by Jimmy C., a friend of the show. Wendy Adelson has taken over Casey Anthony. Harsh words here. Is the most hated woman in Florida. I-M-O, in my opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. John Singer, what about this notion that she gets so close to the house, doesn't bother, bother to check on Dan or the kid's safety, just keeps on going? Is that... I, I, think, it's, I think it's obviously very compelling. I mean, she knew the schedule was clear. She knew that Dan... That Friday was taking the kids to school. He had them. She would be picking them up later in the day. So she knew that they were at school at the time. Um, she didn't have to ask any questions. She knew exactly what was happening. And it, it, it kind of raises a broader point, which is, and I'm glad you, you brought up Judy before, because Judy very recently on her channel did a dramatic reading of the emails from Donna to Wendy during the pendency of the divorce proceedings when the issue of relocation was percolating and the judge was ruling um, in a very habitual way against her during those proceedings, Donna is haranguing Wendy in all of those emails to step up her game, to make sure she acts in a, in, in a more dramatic way that it's so crucial for Harvey, Donna and Charlie for the boys to be back in South Florida it is so clear from those emails that Donna is driving the bus and is hectoring Wendy to play along. Donna is positing all different sorts of scenarios about converting the kids, bribing Dan, doing all sorts of crazy things. And Wendy, by virtue of what Donna was writing, was recalcitrant and pushing back. So I think at the end of the day, from a macro standpoint, Donna, it was done for Donna. Charlie had the ability to do it, and Wendy was in on it for the reasons that are being cited to you right now. The fact that Wendy drove by the crime scene, the fact that Wendy took this circuitous route um, because she knew exactly what was happening and wanted to corroborate what was happening. And we'll go through some of the other reasons later. Do I think it was at Wendy's impetus? No. Did Wendy have advanced knowledge? Yes. Did Wendy take certain acts necessary what we call overt acts to be held guilty to be part of a conspiracy yes so all the things that were the, the two things that we just looked at clearly show wendy's knowledge and involvement we'll get in a little bit to the overt acts that wendy engaged in which because knowledge alone is not enough to impute liability 
you must take an overt act and we can go through the, those that she did. Here, we're just looking at knowledge. And I, I want to underscore that all of the Adelsons are innocent, as these lawyers know, until proven guilty in a court of law. Uh, Shaquille Oatmeal, my favorite name on this show, a favorite guest, writes, I, and I, by the way, I firmly believe this is the real Shaq. He's a true crime fan. He's just coming in incognito a little bit here. I think that's what I want to believe. I think Donna could possibly be next. I think Wendy will never be indicted. Uh, Carl Steinbeck disagrees, but real quick, the OG is in the house. Fancy with an eye. Hi, friends. Expect a person on here that talks smack about me and is generally negative toward others. I saw that guy already, and I wanted to smack the guy that talked smack, but hopefully he has left the building. Um, everyone check out Fancy's YouTube channel if you have not already. And a shout out to Mentor Lawyer, Mentor with a U, Mentor Lawyer. Carl, right back to you. And by the way, Carl, the point you the question you posited to us before we went on camera i thought was really interesting do you want to ask that question again and see if anyone in sts nation has an answer about an ex uh an ex in was it an ex what would, she, would she be the ex-wife knowing correct is that how you how right. did you phrase that question well does any of us know or think we know of anybody that would be even capable of killing their sibling's spouse or ex-spouse without their sibling giving an okay and giving consent and direction. I mean, I, I just, I just don't think anybody would do that, especially when you have kids involved, right? That's, that's the real thing that would stop somebody from doing it without the, uh, the ex's knowledge and consent. So I thought in this particular case, there's no way that the rest of the Adelsons are going to keep Wendy out of it and not have her involved in it. And, and think about it also, she's the lawyer and you can't think of anything more intensely legal than deciding how to kill somebody, right? And they went, would have gone through the script. She was down there two weeks uh, right before the murder up until what, I think six or seven days before the murder happened, all that time to rehearse and script and, and, and uh, play it all out. So there was, there was motive, means and opportunity all coming from Wendy as well. Not just, not just the other Adelsons in Miami. And by the way, not everyone believes in uh, Wendy's guilt. Agent 99, a friend of the show. I'm here, a beer in hand, ready to debate Wendy's innocence. I see John Singer. He's puffing up, ready to go. Georgetown Law. Don't mess with Georgetown Law. Carl, point number three. Uh, pick it up there. All right. This is also uh, another good one. This one actually shows more premeditation and her involvement in the planning of it. And that was the fact that she was dating Jeff Lacoste up until the Monday before he got killed, which was on a Friday. And what happened, according to his testimony, is that everything went fine until three o'clock that afternoon. They had spent some time over lunch and they were going to meet at seven o'clock to do some yoga. And from the time of seven o'clock on, she was a complete different person, didn't treat him with any kind of uh, affection or care and just completely blew him off. And so he realized this thing's over. And after the yoga um, situa situation was over, they were leaving on a parking lot together and he's he's 10 paces away. And then she hollers back at him saying, hey, what are you doing on Friday? So Friday the 18th, he's being killed. And she wanted to know because he had talked about plans going up to uh, Tennessee beforehand. So she wanted to know what his plans were for Tennessee, even though the relationship is over. And she asked some follow up questions to that. And he thought it was very odd and striking that she's worried about my Friday plans when we have no relationship between us anymore. In fact, that night she said, don't ever talk to me again. So very odd behavior. I showed that I think that directly shows her involvement in the planning. And she wanted she was setting him up to be the fall guy and be a target that the police go after as uh, the prime suspect. And does, doesn't he eerily look like Professor Markel? Right. And his car a vehicle eerily looks like the vehicle description of the, the, the murderer's car. Right. Exactly. Hey, Tim. Yeah. Um, I'm curious from you, uh, and I just forgot my question as I was about to ask it. Um, oh, the meticulousness of this, of, of, of these points that Carl is presenting. Um, Georgia Kaplman is obviously excellent at her job. Is she behind the scenes doing something similar, putting bullet point after bullet point together and kind of filling everything in and 
building up the argument um, for Charlie's guilt right now with that trial pending uh, and possibly doing it for other mem members of the Adelson family. Tell us what what's happening with her sort of uh, on a day to day basis as she works on the Markell case specifically. She's very cool, very calm, especially in trial. She doesn't get rattled. Um, she's always thinking ahead. Um, and I'm she's got a good investigator, lead investigator on the case I know well. And I'm sure they're, they've got all these bullet points and they're making the points at the right time to be able to charge these people. I think if she could see what was going on with these points, which I'm sure she has, she's lived this case. The FBI agent, I know very well. He's the one that broke this case by getting that bus, uh, the, the camera on the bus for that vehicle. He looked at, and, and when you talk about an FBI agent, I know a lot of FBI agents. Th this guy does not have much a sense of humor. He truly is an FBI agent. He believes in his job. He's very honest. He loves his work. Uh, he's very diligent. Um, and the, the, the TPD officer that retired, Completely different. Great sense of humor. A lot of experience in homicide. He can get people to talk to him that probably shouldn't. Um, so I think they got a great team. And I think the resources and Jack Campbell, the state attorney, really wants this thing, a conviction for everyone involved. And Tim, this question right back to you from Katie Cool Lady again, uh, a VIP of STS, if you will. Uh, when will we get a firm trial date on Charlie? How do things work in Tallahassee right now? We just know it's pushed to fall 2023, but when will we get the actual date? So people may not know this, but Judge Wheeler is no longer on the criminal docket. He's on a civil docket. So in order for him to do a criminal case, he has to have it specifically set for his civil and criminal cases. And he has to have it set by the state. Um, so that's why they're trying to get a date where he can clear his calendar. Um, I don't think we'll know anything. What they normally do is they'll set a case management date and then they'll give you a case management date. And then usually within 60 to 90 days, you'll set the trial date. And that's when then, and in this case, because of all the witnesses, it's going to be a firm trial date because the judge is clearing his calendar. And, uh, other other people don't know that uh, Judge Wheeler was also your uh, fraternity brother. You let us know that the last show. So I've known him for forty years. Wow, another another factoid related to the case. Um, this is interesting, John Singer. I wonder if you have an opinion on this from Murray Munsey. I wonder if they are bringing charges slowly so that Dan's sons are older when all of them are in jail slash prison. Is this something that? Um, the state would take into consideration, John, as far I, as you no, know? No, I mean, I, there, there's zero chance that's driving the pace of the um, investigation or the charges. But I, I, I did want to pick up on one thing that um, Carl said, because the last reason uh, that Carl gave, the, I guess it was the third reason on his list, to me is the most compelling reason as to why Wendy was in on the advance planning in the advance and had advanced knowledge. Again, just to amplify what, what Carl said, they, they, I think it was a, a Tuesday, not a Monday, because um, I just recently went back and listened to Jeff LaCasse's um, interrogations with the um, police department. On that Tuesday, they had that you know super awkward yoga class. He walks away. She walks away. He tells her he loves her. She said, I know. And then she stops him. And, and as Carl said, you know, he takes takes 10 paces away. She said, hey, you know, when are you going to Tennessee again? What time? And why would she care? What, what conceivable reason would she care after having just broken up with him and having just been separated from him for two weeks while she was in South Beach? Why, why would she care about the logistics of his trip to see friends that weekend in Tennessee, but for the fact that she knew that the murder was going to be taking place right at that time. They had already set up the appointment to fix the TV um, between eight and 12. So they knew the murder was taking place in that window. So she wanted to know um, if he'd be leaving at or about that during that window in the car that looked like the car that actually was the car that effectuated the murder. 
So that to me is the most single damning piece of evidence suggesting that she was in on the um, plan and that she knew ahead of time that it would be taking place. There's no other conceivable reason why she would have cared one iota what Jeff Lacasse's itinerary was. I think, I think John, and I look at it a federal way when they charge a conspiracy and they put the overt acts on there. If they put these overt acts in order, that's going to be so damaging. And so a jury is going to read that media is going to read that. And a juror is going to be easy to go down one by one what she did. And I agree. That is a big point. She took an action, an actual action. And Tim, uh, Agent 99 writes, and I'd like you to respond to this. I cannot understand why Katie would maintain innocence when she had an out. Then when she went on trial, she said, I'm sure it was Charlie. Why would she do that? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. Well, as we all know, John, and sometimes you don't have client control. And sometimes you have to, you have to protect your client from themselves. Um, clients sometimes think I can beat this case. And I remember federal court, people believing that they won't testify against them. And I remember one case where my client believed they wouldn't testify against him. The guy walked in and he basically smelled the marijuana in the courtroom. He was Jamaican. He took this big smell of marijuana, looked at my client and said, I love you, brother, but I got to do it for my family. I got to tell the truth. <laughs> That's before he was even asked one question. How do you object to that? I mean, it's just, you got to tell your clients. I tell them, I said, I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. And they should have gotten her the immunity deal. They shouldn't have pushed her to trial. And I think it was a mistake. And I hate to second guess lawyers because I wasn't in the room. But I know for a fact she was offered immunity. Harold Dull writes, John had been vindicated. I think he's talking about the proffer there. But he also tweeted at me, Carl, and he wrote this. Most of Carl's reasons are items that only indicate prior knowledge of the crime or motive, not enough for an indictment. Please ask Carl what are items that show Wendy Adelson's actions that prove a quote and act in furtherance of conspiracy of murder. You're a lawyer. You can answer that. Well, I don't want to jump ahead of the list. I mean, these okay. things are being developed <laughs> here. So, <laughs> so let's, um, let's ping pong around yeah, let's, them. Let's continue with the list. Right. Um, this I, this next one, number four, I think was the real dagger that made this thing a matter of urgency, not just not just uh, something that needs to happen because summer's happening and they want to get to South Beach, um, get Wendy to South Beach. But this whole thing about the divorce being reopened was the real thing that Wendy's whole life was possibly about to change because Dan was alleged some stuff that was extremely serious. They alleged she duped the court worth $500,000 of hidden assets in her financial affidavit for the divorce that happened the summer of 13. And he, he also alleged that she took some family heirloom uh, from the Markell family. It was an heirloom that uh, someone that survived the Holocaust had had with them. So, I mean, you talk about something extremely sentimental to the Markell family. She took that when she did that Pearl Harbor type of divorce action when uh, Dan was in New York. So he also made, I, I saw that in one of his filings, as recently as the 14th of February, he alleged that her behavior in her various court filings indicated she wasn't basically fit to be a professor at FSU clinics. So he was really ratcheting up and exposing her deceptions to the court and to him. And he wanted those assets back. And, and I think Wendy was not going to be able to face the scrutiny. And by having Dan eliminated, everything went away. Instantly went away. As soon as Dan was killed, all those allegations just vanished. They evaporated. And she got to leave. How soon? Like three days after Dan was killed. That's how soon she was able to go to South Beach. So all the timing of this and, and the motives to clear her name and to not be held responsible for deceiving the court. Because um, I think Tim said that beautifully the last time we were on about what would happen if you lied and with, withheld disclosure of assets of that significant to the court. And so if she's facing loss of bar license, loss of job, and then she doesn't have 
the ability to move the kids to Florida. She would have been stuck in Tallahassee with, you know, perhaps menial work at that point. So that was not going to happen. So the only issue came down to how soon can we get it done? We need to get it done fast. Well, that goes to motive. That She clearly had motive. And I think that last question was a very well question. What acts did she do in furtherance of the conspiracy to make it happen? I think the whole thing with the boyfriend using him as a patsy clearly shows she was taking some action to make sure he was available to be a patsy or at least a suspect. And unbeknownst to her, he left earlier. So he had an alibi in Tennessee. So that is an action that I think um, otherwise her driving by shows she might have known afterwards. But I think there, I think it is. They have to prove she took an overt act. Um, back to John Singer here. Uh, first off, real quick, John, Marie Her- Hernandez. This is a sixty four thousand dollar question. Why can't people just divorce amicably? A lot of people's divorces are messy as hell. Um, at kind of uh, Carl's point number four, is that enough to prove her guilt? Obviously, he had more meat on the bones in point number four, but your thoughts? Just on divorce in general or on Carl's point number four? Carl's point number four. You can tell me about divorce too, John. <laughs> so I think that's a that's a calm question. Um, so yeah. I, I think on I think on Carl's point number four, that, that's the one that doesn't resonate with me that much. And, and I'll tell you why for two reasons. One, Jeff LaCasse's testimony was that Charlie originally looked into hiring a hitman in 2013 after the relocation motion to South Florida was denied with prejudice. So the driver for this whole plan um, and to to, um, murder Professor Markell was the fact that Wendy was going to be stuck in Tallahassee for the next 16 years because she had a two-year-old at the time. So the hitman discussions or exploration began prior to Dan filing a motion to um, accuse Wendy of hiding assets and to take her a bar license. It, it was really on the heels of the relocation um, denial. What I think, and, and I think there may have been some vacillation, I, perhaps Charlie looked into it and then there was some oscillating because Wendy wasn't on board. I think what actually cemented the fate of Professor Markell was not the motion um, levied towards Wendy to try to take away her bar license or accuse her of perjuring herself on her um, financial disclosures. It was the motion vis-a-vis Donna. Donna was accused of disparaging Dan to the kids. Donna was in jeopardy and in peril of being forced to have supervised visits only with the children. That motion was pending as of July 18th when the murder was effectuated. I think it was Donna who had lost it at that point. And and again, maybe I'm jaded because in New York, in commercial litigation, the accusations that fly back and forth from both sides are, are, are terrible, much worse than things that were probably levied towards Wendy. But I think, again, hitman exploration began long before that motion against Wendy was filed. And I think it was the motion against Donna and forcing Donna to have a supervised visit. You've, we've all heard Donna on those wiretaps. Fancy Fiction has posted so many of those. They've been so valuable to all of us who are obsessed with the case. And judging by um, the type of person that Donna seems to be and reading her emails, I think that's what set her over the edge. And at that point, it was over for Professor Markell. Sonny Tanner writes, I think Charlie will flip because he was already slightly jealous and the sis is free and moneyed. I love that word. Um, Tim, do you think there's any chance he flips? And then, John, I'm going to ask you the same question. I think, John, I think both of you kind of uh, alluded to the fact that he probably won't. I don't know. I feel like uh, we've had ex-cons on to discuss this. They don't think that – He's built of the right fabric to uh, live life in the big house uh, where Alec Murdoch is right now. People don't think he can handle it and he might crumble. But uh, Tim Jansen, what do you think? I don't think he's going to flip against his family. Um, I just don't see it. I think if he flipped against it, he'd be jeopardizing his sister, his mother and his father, the grandkids being with with what the grandfather. Uh, I just don't see him flipping. 
Um, he hasn't flipped at this point. I think the lawyers are are settled in and they believe that they can beat this circumstantial evidence case. I believe they're kind of hoping that Mag Bonawa gets a deal and testifies so they can change this trial and basically say, hey, the government is the state is so weak that they had to bring this murder her who they prosecuted twice, dragged her to a conviction, and they're giving her this deal with no corroboration because they know they don't have beyond a reasonable doubt. Turn the trial on Mag on the state. That's what I would do as a defense lawyer. Sonny Tanner also writes, thumbs up, STS Nation. I sure would appreciate it if you hit the like button. It gets the algorithm chugging. Jody, not Judy, but Jody Johnston. I accidentally called her Judy, and I played the tape back, and you are right. I stand corrected. It is Joe D. I have not followed this case. Where should I start? You should start with Asian American Legal Focus on YouTube, Mentor Lawyer on YouTube, Fancy with an I, Fiction on YouTube, and, of course, Carl Steinbeck. Carl, what is the official name of your channel where you go through all these points? Jury Trial Mentor on YouTube. There you go. Start there as well. Want to move on to the next point, Carl? Okay, sure. Um, this one also confirms number four in terms of motive, and that's a few weeks before the murder. Uh, we found this on uh, Mentor Lawyer and Deep Dive True Crime are also good sources of information because you actually see the live testimony uh, interviews between the uh, police and, the, and all the witnesses, um, as well as Wendy, I should add. Um, a few weeks before his murder... Dan tells Tamara Demko that it's heating up, it's ugly, and he's going to the mattresses against Wendy. And she, she described a situation that Dan had, uh, had described her as uh, blow, the point of blowing up. And I think that's really what set him off. And I think part of that also was, uh, as, as John said, by bringing in Donna and uh, her hateful comments she said about Dan to the boys, so I think I think both of them were like just just at, at their wits end and something had to happen drastic and fast. So um, and she also said that Dan didn't cover discover the fraudulent concealment until after the divorce. And uh, and that she, he she believes he was raising the issue before the January 3rd court hearing. And so this thing was just spiraling out of control. And, and, and unfortunately, it led to uh, them to ultimately deciding that it needs to happen fast. And, and the 18th was the last date they were going to let it, that happen. Uh, John Singer, care to uh, retort? I, I think that, I mean, my own feeling is, is that when, when the relocation motion was denied, that was it for Professor Markell. It was going to happen one way or another. Um, again, there may have been fits and starts over the next year. Things may have intensified because of the motion and the allegations against Donna, some of the allegations against Wendy, the exacerbation or the escalation of the divorce proceedings. Someone, some of the comments made to Tamara, I think were, were compelling in that regard as well. But I think there was no way that Wendy was staying in Tallahassee for the next 16 years. It was totally anathema to Donna to have her grandchildren and her daughter away from her. She's already estranged from Robert Adelson. So she has a, distant relationship with those grandchildren. Charlie, you know, didn't look like he was, he, he ended up having a child, but it never looked like he was going to be fathering any children. Um, so I think it was incumbent on Donna to get those boys back in South Florida. And Donna wasn't going to let it happen. She wasn't going to let Wendy sit in Tallahassee for the next 16 years. So when relocation was denied, that was it for Dan. The question is, you know, when was it going to be? One, one point I wanted to um, hearken back to that Tim raised, which is a fantastic point, and, and I made, I, I've alluded to this before on, on the show. Rashbaum would welcome <laughs> Mad Manu's testimony at the Adelson trial. Why? Because the evidence against Adelson, Charlie Adelson is so compelling so overwhelming, the admissions on the Dolce Vita recording, the dearth of motive for anybody else in the world other than the Adelson family to want Professor Markell killed, the wiretaps, not going to the police, we can go on forever. But if you put Magmanua on the witness stand, then it becomes the trial or the trial within the trial. Then it all becomes all about Katie. 
and it takes the onus off of Charlie. So I have said from the beginning that Rashbaum would welcome Katie Magnua getting up on the witness stand because it would divert the jury's attention. It would muddy the waters. It would make a very clean and very, in my opinion, easy case against Charlie much more difficult. And, and just finally, the last point that Tim raised um, about flipping, whether Charlie would flip on Wendy. You know, if you listen to the wiretaps between Charlie and Donna, those two are thicker than thieves. And there's a lot of sort of comments made about Wendy, Wendy being a trust fund baby, Wendy not having to work for things, Wendy not seeing the importance of marrying Dave, who she was dating at the time, all sorts of negative connotations and negative comments being spewed about Wendy, which would lead one to believe that Charlie may flip on her. But at the end of the day, even though Charlie watched the last two trials and saw how good the prosecution is and was, I still think he thinks he's going to beat it. I think his lawyer doesn't, but I think he thinks that if he gets up on the witness stand, he believes in himself, the bravado, the arrogance. He thinks, I think he thinks he's going to beat this. And I don't think he's going to flip on any of his family members. You know who else thought they were going to beat it? Everyone says Alec Murdoch. Yep. Two uh, concurrent lights. Is it concurrent, Tim? Consecutive. Consecutive. I always screw that up. Harold Dull writes, uh, Tim, this is a nice short answer. A uh, question for Tim. How would you defend Wendy? Um, in all seriousness, you can't, you, you know, you can't present an entire case here, but uh, a question I'm going to tag on to this and you can just give a brief, your brief answer is, is Charlie making a mistake by hiring a non Tallahassee defense attorney uh, in this case? Cause you uh, have mentioned before that Tallahassee sort of operates uh, in its own world uh, to a degree. So both questions, if you could take a quick, quick answer at both of them. Well, first of all, uh, he doesn't know the lawyers. He doesn't know the prosecutors. He doesn't know the jurors. He doesn't know the judge and he won't know the jury panel where they come from. So it's always, they're going to be at a, a disadvantage. Um, he doesn't know the bailiffs people. He's not going to get any favoritism. Um, sometimes something's going to happen and he probably should have local counsel. So local counsel can get information that they're not going to get being in Miami. I can tell you the prosecutors of here have no love for lawyers in Miami coming up here telling us we don't know how to try cases. We don't know how to do work. They, they look down on Tallahassee lawyers. It's a very small collegial group. We get along very well, even though we try cases with vigorous uh, animosity in the courtroom. I think they miss out on that. I think lawyers that hire Miami, it's fine. Just get a local counsel that can give them advice. And I know um, Andrew Gillum's lawyers have been calling me for advice. Um, and, and that's a different case. But as far as Wendy, hey, listen, Wendy's a little sister. They're trying to take care of Wendy. Wendy couldn't solve her problems on her own. She tried. Wendy had to have her mom and her big brother take care of things. They perfectly kept things away from her because they didn't want Wendy to be implicated in any way. They wanted to protect Wendy because she has these two small children. While they were doing these crimes and doing... They made sure Wendy knew nothing about it and took no actions. And so she is innocent. And if you convict them, she did nothing, no overt acts to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Carl, LJ writes, all these Carl points provide for the broth the jury will hear. Uh, it seems you are a step ahead of the game here, Carl, in presenting your case. Point number six, I believe we're up to. Don't worry, guys. We'll do like a 90-part series here. We'll get all 100 <laughs> points done by uh, by the time the trial begins. Carl? All right, number six is a small point, but it's a very strong point to show consciousness of guilt. And that's a fact that the night before Dan is killed, Wendy decides to change her Facebook photo that she's had the same one there for two years, her and her kids sitting on a couch. And then she switches out to a Photoshop one that her dad did the Photoshopping for of her being single and attractive looking. And that would be most appealing to when her name is uh, an image is plastered, plastered all over the news media stations from Miami to Tallahassee and elsewhere. So she made sure she had the right image presented there. So I think that's very telling, very strong. And just one little thing like that, you may think, well, that's a real minor point, Carl, but I'm telling you, juries 
they'll look at that just like in the Murdo case. They'll look at one little thing and that one little thing goes on. You know what? She knew about it. It was about to happen. And I think even under Florida law, maybe I'm wrong on this, Tim, but under Florida law for a conspiracy, I don't even think all conspirators have to take an act in furtherance. I think just one party has to, but they had to have been part of the planning. And then the flip side of that is if you charge them as a co-principal, I know this has been the case in, in state and, and military courts for me, is if you charge somebody as an actual co-principal, then all they have to do is present something showing as a prosecutor, you just have to present something showing that they had done something to advise, assist, command, counsel, procure, ask, something like that is all it takes to show that there are an actual principle. So I think the threshold bar here for Wendy is way lower under the law than, than, I, than I think a lot of us tend to realize. John Singer. So just to underscore that, Wendy changes her Facebook profile the day before the murder from mom of two kids to single and photoshopped. Um, does that hint at guilt? Uh, merely a coincidence? And uh, do these things all add up over time? And let me throw another question at you because I know you're smart enough to handle it. Uh, David writes, they have to prove Wendy is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, whether we like her or not. Can you talk about what that really means? We hear that expression all the time, but what does it really mean? So <clears throat> with respect to the Facebook photo, I, I do like that point. I think it's a really good one um, by Carl. She, you know, obviously Wendy's face was going to get, and her image was going to get plastered all over the media as the ex-wife in the aftermath of the murder. So why not, given how vain she is and what a narcissist, she is, why not make herself more attractive? I guess John Lauro, her lawyer, would say, well, wait a minute. She just broke up with her boyfriend of six months, two days earlier. What's the first thing people do when they break up with a significant other? They change their picture on social media because that's going to be their picture now um, on their dating app. So, you know, I think that it's a, it's a great point by Carl. I think that Lauro could argue um, around it. But reasonable doubt. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna cede that question uh, to Tim because I think he can probably handle it better than I can. Um, Tim, that's probably best for you to handle. Tim, for, what was the question about reasonable doubt? I mean, what we always hear, you know, about reasonable doubt. Uh, someone says you can really hate the Adelsons, but you've got to prove all this beyond a reasonable doubt. What does that really mean? Well, the the jury instruction will say not all doubt. It's got to be reasonable something that you would re rely on in your most important affairs that you would do? Is it to the degree that you would make a decision? Um, you can't prove someone did it 100%, but it's got to be reasonable and consider all the evidence. Is it reasonable doubt? And if you don't believe you know, strongly in a conviction, then you have a reasonable doubt. Uh, it, it's broad enough. It's open there that jurors can... But really, they, would you do your most important affairs based on that information, that's beyond a reasonable doubt. Good explanation. Uh, Song Bits, Laura writes, hello, made my first live, found your channel recently and watching. Welcome to you, Song Bits, Laura. Uh, Carl, it's also important to point out, we were, as I mentioned, all just watching this Alec Murdoch trial and just, you know, days before the verdict, even beyond that, people said there's no way he's getting convicted uh, the guy got convicted in under three hours and jurors said that they really just spoke for about 45 minutes. So just goes to show you never really know what a, a jury is thinking. Um, is that your experience? And then let's move on to uh, point number seven, I think. Right. I, I think it uh, on the Murdo case, I, I was really puzzled by all those comments saying it's going to be a hung jury. There's no, nothing the state's proven so far. And this is even after the videotape or that Snapchat where within minutes after that, his wife and son got murdered. And so I thought when I saw that, that's a smoking gun. He, he's done and over with. And everything else of these circumstances are going to point that same direction because he's going to be frantic, trying to conceal his uh, involvement in it. And, and sure enough, you heard about all those things he was doing, trying to trying to uh, intimidate witnesses, get him to change her story, how, how long he was at his mother's house and all those kind of things. All that, all that just corroborates the fact that he was he was the one that did this. And so I think that um, 
for for Wendy's particular case here, we don't have as, as what I'd call as smoking gun as strong as we did in the Murdo case. But I think the first couple points are so strong that I, I think any jury, once they see that, they're going to really grasp the fact that she was involved on it. And the other thing I might add from my trial experience is that jurors really study the accused and his interaction or her interaction with all the witnesses that testify and the kind of questions that are asked and how they interact through eye contact and whatnot. And, and if you study what Wendy has done in her testimonies, you, you, she has no um, indication that she has discussed an annoyance or, or anger towards any of the killers sitting there at the table. And she never has the, um, she never has what I thought when she did the interview with, with uh, Detective Isom, I thought those were fake tears and I thought Murdo's tears were fake as well. I thought he was just sort of rocking back, trying to make it look like he's upset. And, and, then, and then the first juror I heard interviewed said that Murdo didn't even cry. He was just rubbing snot over his face to make it look wet. Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff that really shows how jury's going to look at what was going on. And I think that's why it would be very crucial for the state to when they charge Wendy to also add the perjury charge for how she testified. And there's so many things that she, there's um, indicators that she lied about that. I mean, I could go on and on about that alone. So I, I think that would also get that videotape into evidence and they would see how she doesn't have any um, she doesn't have any sorrow or feelings of loss for the kids. I mean, she does not come across as a, as a victim at all. In fact, she comes across that she still seethingly despises and hates Dan. So that with that being the theme of how she comes across if she, because I don't think there's any way a lawyer would let her testify because she, she comes across so horrible, lies all the time. Any, I think any jurors is going to see through all that. And she would be convicted in large part because of that as well, besides the circumstantial evidence. So I think uh, when they see her videotape uh, testimony um, of what she did against uh, Katie uh, one and two, I think any jury is going to look at that and, and think she was in them on it and she's guilty and it's going to be a pretty quick verdict. I love this question from Katie, cool lady, the VIP. Question to Carl. Do you think Wendy is paying attention to shows like this podcast? Do you think she might be in this chat right now? And I guess the same question would go for, uh, be some free advice for Georgia Kappelman from you. But what do you think about this question? Um, I would tend to say no, but you never know, Carl. I don't know if she's looking right now, but I would say I think she's getting stuff – uh, filtered through her or to her and she's being told what's going on and I think that uh, that she's aware of the uh, the efforts of the prosecution to come after other family members so she's got to feel like she's in, in the crosshairs. Singer your thoughts on that question? I, I, would agree. I, I agree with Carl I think that um, her lawyer is canvassing every show every podcast everything that's um informative about this case because you don't know what um he, he may pick up certain things and he may extrapolate certain things that can be helpful but i don't think she per se is watching but i, th I think the information is being filtered to her in some sort of a way tim jansen in this modern world are you looking at youtube channels or social media if you have a high profile case to see what uh the court of public opinion is saying tim either my jury consultant is or my private investigator is as a lawyer, you don't have time to be looking at all those podcasts. But I will tell you, there's a lot of bright people out there, a lot of smart people. And every time you got someone neutral look at something that you overlook, it can be a really good point that they see you don't see because you're immersed in the case. Um, so you could get some good defenses or some the prosecutor could. I believe that Georgia is not going to muddy her case up by putting Meg Bonawa on. And also remember... She's not going to go to that family and say, I'm going to cut a deal for this woman who we've convicted for life, uh, who was a conduit to this, your son's murder, because even though she's given crappy testimony, it's not corroborated. I'm not going to ask an appellate court to withdraw jurisdiction, and I'm not going to ask the trial judge to reduce her sentence based on that. Deep Dive True Crime says, hi, everyone. That is Mentor Lawyer. If you want to start somewhere, no better place than Deep Dive True Crime. Uh, a super sticker from Faticus. Hello, Faticus. And uh, Carl, on to your next point, please. All right. I think also uh, the month of June is a very key indicator. 
Jeff Lacoste, he said that during that month, Wendy acted very strange and bizarre. And one of the strangest things she was doing is that he would be, for example, playing with the kids in the living room. And then she'd be in the kitchen where he, had, he could see from the living room. She'd be in the kitchen crying. And he would ask her, what's going on? Why are you crying? And she would not tell him why. So I think she knew something's drastically going to change in her life. And she's probably, you know, fearful about being uh, facing the police interviews and whatnot. So it, it was going to be a major change in her life. But it was, they were at the point of no return, like we've been saying here tonight, where she, they, she was getting to Miami one way or the other. And Dan was the only thing in the way. So he, he had to go. Um, to J. Thomas Reset, a friend of the show, watches with his wife. Verify this. Markel was out by Benton Hills Road, sprang off his driveway when the crew rolled up on him, broad open daylight. He was in his car. Correct, him. He was on his car on a phone. Just yeah. got back from the gym working out. He wasn't spraying he was not, any. Yeah, he was on the phone uh, yeah. talking to his kids, uh, someone at his kid's school, and out of nowhere – comes a man with a gun, shoots him in the head twice. Uh, broad daylight, though. Um, Carl, uh, next point. All right. Um, back to June again. Wendy had canceled the California trip to see Jeff Lacoste's parents under the guise that they may be late for the custody exchange the next day on the 18th of July. So um, I think that was a additional planning and they're focused on the 18th. And so that, I think all that shows that uh, she was already cutting out Jeff from the picture and she was stringing along though, cause he, she needed him to be that Patsy fall guy to be the jilted lover where she dumps him a couple days before the murder actually happens. So he becomes a prime suspect. Uh, John Singer, uh, your thoughts on that? I, I, I like those last two points a lot from Carl. Um, what happened in June, if, if you recall, from Jeff Lacasse's, um, one of his three interrogation sessions in, in July, and then there was one um, that occurred in March. He said that right around June 4th, which is when Rivera and Garcia took their first trip up to Tallahassee and ultimately decided not to um, effectuate the hit. Um, there were reasons why, I guess, that it couldn't happen logistically, but they were in Tallahassee. It was when they were heading up to Tallahassee when Wendy started feeling super nauseous and uh, Jeff Lacasse had to run out and get her um, medicine that she wasn't um, experiencing food poisoning. She wasn't sick. She was a nervous wreck spontaneously. It just sort of came on and it was concomitant with the trip that these two guys, Garcia and Rivera were taking from Miami to Tallahassee. So that is a big problem for Wendy and Lacasse's testimony is very powerful on that point um, as well. So the, the, whole notion, the whole notion as to what was happening in June is very problematic for Wendy. The other thing that, that, that Carl said, which is I think a great point, is they were supposed to see LaCasse's family between July 11th and the 17th. Um, and she had to cancel the trip. She was worried about bad weather, allegedly because she, and, and this is LaCasse's intonation, she had to be back in Tallahassee on July 18th because that's the day that Dan Markell was going to be murdered. <laughs> so she cancels that trip. That's a huge piece of testimony. That, that's, a, that's a huge piece of evidence that can be used against her. Um, and again, there's no reason not to believe Jeff Lacasse. He, he, by all intents and purposes, from his three interrogation sessions and his two rounds of testimony at Magmanua 1 and Magmanua 2, Sounds extremely believable. He's a really good witness and a very bad one for Wendy. My dad used to make me read Herman Melville and Nathaniel Hawthorne to get ready for my SAT so I would know vocabulary words. Now I'm going to make my kids listen to STS and John Singer because he uses words like concomitant, which I'm going to ask my kids if they know how to spell after this show. And I run a tight ship. The oldest is only eight. They better start learning now. Cl uh, Cliff Frankenberger writes, Tim, this one's for you. Question for the panel. Thoughts on the potential that Wendy may have had a strong suspicion without being directly involved. It would be it would explain all her strange behavior. This is uh, where the intricacy of the law. Uh, Carl is shaking his head. No, but Tim, this is where the intricacy of the law becomes uh, so fascinating to me. Uh, where do you draw the line here? 
legally? Well, I, I've always said in a courtroom, where you stand depends on where you sit. I could argue this on both sides of the equation, right? Mm. I can say her actions are not consistent with someone whose kid, whose father had just been killed. Or I can say she was kept in the dark because of her family protecting her. She's like a mushroom. You know, she's kept in the dark and she had no idea what was going to happen. Um, but her actions clearly are going to come into play. Uh, her actions with the boyfriend are clearly, now you can argue about the, the whole ride going by the house. There is an ABC. If you come out of bed and you take a left, there is an ABC liquors there. But where she was coming from, there was a more direct route. Okay. But the fact that she would have seen police and all the cars that would have been there, ambulances, and you would have seen the house from Benton, she clearly would have, I mean, any parent would have jumped out of that car and been running down to that house. Just like the Murdoch case. You find a loved one there, you're going to be holding them till 911 comes. She did nothing. Uh, went to lunch with her friends. Um, her actions don't demonstrate someone that had any kind of remorse. Um, it's more like she was building a defense. What do we got? Another lawyer going to take the stand in a murder trial and has questionable credibility. Another one. Interesting. Um, Harold Dull writes, Carm thinks that Wendy lit a fire under Donna. Carm is on the record saying that for those asking. My beautiful mother is 83 years old. Um, she said that uh, she can't retire fully because I won't let her, but she's only doing the show live on Sunday night. Every Sunday live with Carm at 7 p.m. And once uh, this trial gets underway, uh, we will be doing Dan Markell all the time. Uh, Carl, on to the next point, sir. Okay, number nine. If 18th of January wasn't a highlight in, in Wendy's actions to date, we have another one. And that is the fact that when she canceled out on the Florida trip to see Jeff's parents, then they planned that trip to uh, St. Augustine and they were supposed to come back on the 18th. And on the 18th, guess what kind of conversation she had with Jeff? It was about, we need to leave bright and early and we need to be there by noon because I'm worried about the handoff of custody at four o'clock. And Jeff was like, what do you mean? We got to get up, you know, zero dark 30 to get on the road to be there by noon when you got a four o'clock handoff. So there was such a fixation with what was going on the 18th and, and the custody of the kids that doesn't make any sense unless you were in on it. John, uh, let me unmute you here. Agre agree. I mean, I agree a hundred percent. I think that, you know, the logistics, the Tennessee trip for LaCasse, the cancellation of the California trip to see Jeff LaCasse's parents, the St. Augustine, um, you know, excursion and the necessity of being back, all evidence of consciousness of guilt. I, I have a question for um, Tim and Carl. You, you got, I'm sure you guys have, are, are very familiar with Wendy's, um, Donna's emails to Wendy. And, and again, I, I just recently heard a dramatic reading of those by Judy on her channel. And that was really uh, quite, uh, quite good. Um, it, it appears from those emails, if you, if you, if you, if you hear Donna or, or listen to her words, it's almost as, as if Wendy wants this all to go away. It's almost as if Wendy has resigned herself to the fact that after relocation was denied, she was going to be stuck in Tallahassee she, can't, she wanted to move on. It was almost as if Donna had a light of fire under her. So what I think, and, and you tell me if you agree, I think that Wendy's, one of her biggest defenses is going to be, if she ever does get indicted, and I think we all hope that, that she will, one of her defenses is going to be, look at these emails. My mother is haranguing me, badgering me to take action, convert the boys, bribe Dan, do something. And I just want to move on with my life. I was going to be okay in Tallahassee. Um, so th those emails actually are very helpful for Wendy because the tenor of those suggest that Wendy was not in on this or Wendy was not an active participant. So just curious as to what you thought about the emails from Wendy's perspective. Carl? Well, I think that the game changer for all that, why that's 
while that's true, she was ratcheting things up, and they're both in the in the, in the crosshairs and for Dan's motions, right? We agree on that. Mm -hmm. I think they didn't want to face the hearing date, so I think they both had uh, the fear. But Donna is not a lawyer, and she would understand the fear of losing your bar license. Okay, the fear of losing your bar license. You know, us three can really comprehend that, and maybe the audience can if they're not lawyers. But somebody's threatening your bar license. And they said, and you got the right judge, the judge who is a no-nonsense judge and just shut her down from her initial testimony to the court because she came up with such frivolous reasons to, uh, to completely reopen and change the, uh, the agreed uh, divorce terms. So I, I think that, uh, and also her behavior in, in June, and I think all these other indicators of Wendy knowing something's going on and planning it and, and trying to come up with a, uh, a fall guy, it shows that she was in on it. She doesn't have to be the main driver of it. And I don't, I don't know if the state even has to argue that. She was a main beneficiary, definitely. The main beneficiary, if you look at it from a financial standpoint, and that's one of my next points, from the financial standpoint, she made off like she won the lottery. And hey, all Carl, the litigation problems went away. I, I, I disagree with the whole bar license. Um, first of all, as lawyers, and I'm a member of the Florida Bar, you pretty have to do steal from your client to lose your bar license. Secondly, Wendy wasn't actually practicing law. She was a professor. She has a law degree. My understanding, she wasn't even an active lawyer. She had a law degree. She wasn't practicing law. She was teaching. In her mind, I think the last thing was thinking about her filing a frivolous financial. People do that in every divorce case. And judges see it all the time. And to get to the point where they're going to say, oh, uh, it's that degree I'm going to forward you to the Florida bar. I doubt that was really in her mind. I think that's the weakest argument about losing her license. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not even sure that Georgia will make it, but I don't think that it's, it's going to carry the water. Well, and um, I'm not saying she would have had that. I think it's in the back of her mind. And like I say, in his motion that I saw, Dan said in the 14th of February that uh, she wasn't, uh, her actions uh, were unfitting and unbe unbecoming of a professor there. So um, the job, babe. yeah, maybe the job. Yeah, you may be right. 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 So at least the job. Um, John, did you want to jump in? I, I saw you getting ready to move. There. Yeah, I, I guess I just, I just was curious, um, you know, again, with the, with the emails that they, the, the, the emails are, are troubling to me because they, they really connote that Wendy is somehow a much more passive participant in this whole thing, and is and is almost and it, it seems like she's thwarting Donna's suggestions as to how to induce Dan to acquiesce to the relocation. It looks like Wendy, from what Donna's writing, it, it really connotes that Wendy is is ready to move on in Tallahassee. So I'm I'm wondering, um, Tim, as if you're, I assume you're familiar with the emails, whether you think that Wendy could use those to her advantage in any sort of upcoming prosecution of her, if that comes to fruition. Well, I think you're right on the emails. I think it, it kind of helps Wendy. It makes her a much, much less pa more passive than it was Donna. Um, and I think George is going to have to weigh whether I'm going to charge them both in the same trial. If I introduce these emails, because if you charge Donna, you got to introduce these emails and, John, Laurel, he's going to say, didn't she was passive, wasn't she? Uh, there might be a separate trial because of that information. But I think you're right, John. I, I think those emails are a double-edged sword, as we call a Hobson's choice for the prosecution, whether they use them in a joint trial. Um, yeah, those, those emails clearly sink Donna. I mean, she is completely unhinged in the emails. And ultimately, again, I think that it, this was done for Donna. I mean, sure, Wendy was the beneficiary, um, but this clearly was done for Donna primarily. That's always been my belief. Um, but Donna is, 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 there's an angry tone towards Wendy. It's, it's as if Donna's saying to Wendy, you're not fighting hard enough. Your brother has, and, and your father have made sacrifices, Wendy. Harvey has had to give up dental hours to travel to Tallahassee. It's a long trip. Charlie has suffered a diminution in income. We are all sacrificing and you, Wendy, are not doing your part. You need to start getting serious. You need to start enrolling the boys in Sunday school. 
you need to start um, doing things that are going to get under Dan's skin. You are just content to sit here passively and lose every motion. Your lawyer is not cooperating. Your lawyer is not fighting hard enough. Those emails are horrendous for Donna. They're, they're actually pretty helpful for Wendy. There's other things that are terrible for Wendy, and, and Carl has ticked off a bunch of those, but just the emails themselves are of, are of concern from me. I would, I would say that um, any notions that Wendy is sort of uh, a bystander in this and her mother's pushing her around is really refuted by a lot of Wendy's actions. And she actually is very strong, calculating, and, uh, and mean and vicious. I mean, look at the way she's treated her kids, denying them visitation of Markel's. That is an ultimate cruel thing when you can do that to your own kids to try to wipe out an entire family, change their names. I mean, that is like, that is like, I, I can't think of anything more that speaks to the hatred of the Markels. I mean, even the middle name of one of the uh, boys had a Markel connection and that had to be changed as well. So I don't, I, I don't submit that that's all Donna's doing. I think also the Pearl Harbor style divorce going to the safe deposit box a year before filing for divorce and rating the contents. That's, that's all Donna's, that's not all Donna's doing, right? That's, that's Wendy's doing. And so I think Wendy is coming across very much um, like she's just sort of being pushed around of sorts. But, but I, I would argue that she was an active main role in this. She just wasn't putting it out on paper and incriminating herself like her mom was. And, uh, for example, when do you see pushback from Wendy talking about dressing up the kids as Hitler youth? Do you see any pushback from Wendy? No. She's how about all the hitman comments? Is she pushing back on that? No, she thinks it's funny to tell that to strangers. So I think all these are indications, as well as her testimony, when she won't even uh, admit that Dan is the father of her kids. So anyway, that's, there's, that's on that. there's, a there's a defense in federal court and state court. Mere presence alone is insufficient to prove a conspiracy or an overt act. So that she's talking, if she's not actively encouraging or, or, or motivating her mother or her brother to do something, her lawyer is going to focus in on that. You know, that, that mere presence and just listening to what they're saying, she's not um, acting or asking them to act, at least not in the emails. I mean, that's, that's, the, right. you, that's the problem. I think you're right. The emails are important. It shows the family. It shows the motive of certainly the mother and the brother. Um, so I just throw that out for. Go, yeah. We'll go. I agree, that, I agree. You can argue that where it cuts against uh, being incriminated towards Wendy, but I think, like, like I say, there's so many other indicators that show Wendy was was uh, more than just a bystander or, or or somebody that merely had knowledge of this. And we'll go through a few more points. A quick comment from Veronica Ampudia. Carl, you are brilliant. You basically handed this uh, state's closing arguments for Wendy's trial, followed by Jeep Girl Lily. This panel is fire. Best guess. It's not just a tagline. It's our life here at STS Nation. Bring you the very best. Uh, Carl, uh, next point, please. Um, this is more of a motive point. Number 10 is that uh, killing Dan turned Wendy essentially into a trust fund baby as her own brother admitted to on the wiretap tapes, right? So just from merely this social security uh, disability or, or uh, survivability benefits for her children amount to almost $5,000 a month. And so calculating that out to the life of the kids from the time of Dan's death, you're talking over $2 million. And then Dan also had big life insurance policies for in the boys' names so I don't know what she'd be getting to that, but there's there's a, millions there as well that she would access to on a monthly basis. I understand there's also benefits uh, that were from the state as well at the FSU Law School that Dan would have had as well. So she's rolling in all this cash now. And uh, and so that also provided her immediate access to be able to, uh, to move to South Beach. So those things in, in total with the other things we mentioned so far, paint a really good picture of, for why she wanted this done. So Carl, the... The Social Security, the kids will get till they're 18 or maybe 22 while still attending college. That $2 million, are you talking about Social Security benefits she will get from him because they weren't divorced? Is that a part of that package? Right, so right. The kids There's aren't going to get $2 million. Pardon me? The kids aren't going to get $2 million. And no, she is. Right. 
for taking care of the kids. So in addition to the trust fund money, she's getting money from the government. And I mean, that stuff really adds up. So um, you, you can live pretty well off all the, all this money that's coming her way. John and Singer, they're well, work, essentially. basically she doesn't have to work after this. Yeah. So John, they're a pretty affluent family. Uh, do you see money as a possible motive as well here as Carl is suggesting, if I'm understanding him correctly? No, I don't. I mean, I th and I think that the, in the two trials in the, you know, in, in the Garcia Madmanua trial one and then Madmanua two, I think the state had it right. The motive was relocation. Was there an ancillary pecuniary benefit to Wendy Adelson? Sure. But that was never the focus of the prosecution, nor should it have been. The motive was relocation and to get the grandchildren back in South Florida and to get Wendy back. But just to harken back to one thing that, um, that was said earlier um, by Carl, I want to make it clear and I want to demarcate between what's in the emails and Wendy in general. W Wendy is a reprehensible individual. She lied through her teeth on the stand twice. She took shots at Dan left and right on the witness stand very gratuitously. She came across as completely loathsome. Um, by all accounts, if you listen to Jeff Lacasse or anybody else who knew her well, um, she's a despicable person. She acted for five straight hours in the interrogation. Um, and the fact what she did with um, the name changes and cutting off contact with the grandparents is unforgivable and is really heartbreaking. And it's, it's one of the reasons why so many of us have become so obsessed with this case. It's the anger and the vitriol at Wendy Adelson, at Charlie Adelson, at Don Adelson for doing what they did. And Wendy should bear as much brunt as anybody else. I was simply saying that the emails themselves are going to be, I think, an asset to Wendy because they really do connote a one-sided approach. It looks like Donna is badgering Wendy to get on board with all these draconian measures to try to get Dan to acquiesce. So I wasn't suggesting at all that the emails exonerate Wendy. I wasn't trying to say that Wendy is a good person. She's the furthest thing. I was simply saying that the emails in and of themselves are particularly terrible for Donna, but I think John Loro is gonna make some hay of them if Wendy ever does get indicted. Hey Tim, this question is interesting to me. Um, do you think she, I think meaning Wendy is being tracked and I think they mean under some sort of surveillance um, any possibility that that's still going on with wiretaps, et cetera, et cetera. At the very least, I would think that uh, Donna, Wendy, and Harv are uh, not sleeping great at night thinking it could be the case, right, Tim? Well, I don't know about tracked. And, and to get a wiretap, that is the most extreme measure that a court would give somebody. You have to pretty much prove to the court you've taken every other avenue to collect evidence of a crime and that the only way you can collect this evidence is through a wiretap. I don't think they're going to reach that threshold. I think Isom's retired. Uh, I don't think at this point they're tracking her. They might from the standpoint they don't want her to leave the country. But if she has her children here, they're probably monitoring her, making sure the kids are still in school. Now, if they see the kids get on a plane the grandparents and the kids and when to get on a plane for a country with no extradition, I think they'll have some problem with that. Uh, but I don't think they're tracking her or a wiretap at this point. Mackie McCary writes, STS, I watch every night learning so much from your panel of amazing experts, as do I. That's why I love hosting the show. Huge Tim fan. We're making this guy a, a star. Uh, he is grounded in thought process, actively listens and always spewing wisdoms. Uh, isn't that the case? Tim is making himself a star. Soon he might leave us behind, uh, but hopefully not. He'll, he'll, remember, he'll remember us, I hope. Um, Carl, on to the next point. We, we're almost an hour and 30 minutes. My dream is let's get through uh, point 15 here, and then we'll, uh, I don't know, break it down. I'm never good at math. About an eight-part series. Uh We'll have these guys back maybe uh, every week or so and uh, continue to go through the points leading up to the trial. Uh, Carl, 
Next uh, number 11 is a point showing how bold and brazen Wendy is. And that's the Pearl Harbor divorce, uh, the way she moved out of the house behind Dan's back, found her own place. Wouldn't tell Dan, I think I heard for like six weeks where she actually lived with the kids. Dan was freaking out. He got to see them, I think, a couple days after he got back from New York when he, when he made an emergency flight back. But she was trying to do everything she could to jerk his heart around and uh, his love for the kids. And, um, and again, she, she made off, he found out then she made off with hundreds of thousands in cash. Um, all the furniture for the most part was taken uh, the kids rooms. Um, everything was gone except clothes that didn't fit them anymore. So that's, that's how much she ransacked the house of anything, uh, that Dan could have used for the kids and their home there. Um, and not to mention that family heirloom. Um, let's move along to the next point here, Carl, right. just so we can, uh, Get through this, this. Here's a real dagger as well to show uh, premeditation and, and uh, planning. Approximately five days before Dan is murdered, she tells Jeff about the year prior plot to kill um, Dan Markell planned by her brother, Charlie. And the words were Charlie had explored all options to take her problem and looked at having Professor Markell killed. So for her to make that comment just a few days before he's actually killed, why would you mention it? It was completely out of context of anything they're talking about. It's such a bizarre moment. It's like, like a consciousness of guilt admission at that point. So I, I, would, I would submit that that is a very strong indicator that A, he's going to get killed, and B, she knew it. John or Tim? John? I, I think that point 11 um, about the Pearl Harbor – <clears throat> is not evidence of guilt. I think it's evidence of what a deplorable um, character she is. But I think point 12 is a dagger. Um, it, it definitely evidences consciousness of guilt. For her to blurt that out in the days, a few days antecedent to the hit being um, coming to fruition, I think is a big problem for her. That's a, that's a really, really strong favor for the prosecution. This is something that Carm harps on. My mother, who is a... Uh licensed therapist she always says wendy is a manipulator uh that's one way to look at it carl next point as we get through these here these last okay. i think it's anybody that's really following the case closely you'll understand that this tv was the code for the murder okay so anybody talking about the tv they're in on the murder i would submit carl give a little backstory on that for those who don't okay. know just a quick so as a divorce present supposedly charlie got this big screen tv for wendy's house and he joked to her supposedly and said hey i i was looking at hiring a hit and man but the tv is a lot cheaper so i went with the tv option and she weirdly would mention this periodically uh throughout the next year while dan was still alive and incidentally she mentions it to the geek squad repairman just hours before dan is murdered I mean, what are the coincidences that would happen? It's, it's one of those Murdo coincidences, right? It's, it's just too, too unreal to have any other explanation that you know something's about to go down. And she was doing that to try to secure, I, I think, uh, an alibi. Hey, it's not me. It might be other people, but it's not me um, to try to sec secure com some kind of alibi. And another reason I would submit that, you know, she's, she's in on this and, and part of the planning is that Think about a broken TV. She said one of her boys smashed the screen. What kind of an educated person is going to call a Best Buy and ask them to come out and schedule a repair guy to see if they can fix this thing under warranty when anybody knows that, A, it's either not going to be covered under warranty or you just call them up and ask them. You're not going to go ahead and schedule this. And so even though supposedly Donna was the one that scheduled this appointment from Miami, which strongly implicates her, the fact is, you know, Wendy's a part of it as well by playing stupid with with can this be fixed under warranty and then also mentioning that comment and also coincidentally it happening the day that Dan is supposed to get killed and did get uh, shot at and killed the next morning. Hey, Tim, I, I, this, think, I this, think that in a murder case and a conspiracy, text messages and phone conversation, there are no, you know, coincidences. Language is always used as code. Sometimes you break the code. Sometimes you never break the code. Um, my take on Wendy was when she testified at the trial, and I, and I think it was the last trial, 
she was laughing. She was giving that laughter like, like a psychopath uh, that didn't even think this was a serious event. She asked, George asked her a question and she started laughing. And he, what killed me was she goes, well, what happens if you get arrested? Ha ha ha, that's not going to happen. Baiting the prosecutor, believing in her own mind that she's covered herself enough, she's never going to get arrested. Telling that to Georgia, who's already labeled her as an unindicted co-conspirator in the previous filings. Tim, you know Georgia. How does she take that? Is it, she's competitive. Uh, she doesn't Dairy. want to be called out, right? Very. And she puts it in the bank and she's going to use it and she's going to end up making her eat those words. Mm. That's that's justice. Hold on, John Singer. Go ahead, John Singer. She actually used it. I mean, if it, it, the just to um, clarify, in the first trial um, in 19, that's when. Wendy, in a very psychopathic way, laughed and said, the state's not going to arrest me. And then in the second trial, Georgia reminded her of those words. They were talking about immunity and Georgia said, oh, yeah, because the state's not going to arrest you. Right. Like she she had that in her bank and she broke it out. Um, And just I'm sorry, one last thing on the TV, just to amplify what um, Carl said. If you recall, in the initial discussions after the bump, in April of 16, Donna says to Charlie, I think, I think this TV is going to cost about $5,000. So the TV was code all the way along. And it just, it's insane that, that, you know, or, or I would say not coincidental that on the day the murder was getting um, effectuated that all of a sudden, you know, the TV repairman's at the house. That's, that's not a coincidence. Yeah. You know, I keep going back to this and I'm no lawyer, but I could be a juror is that <laughs> the little things to me are the biggest things, you know, like the Murdoch case. He he denied he's at the kennels voice on the tape done. You can't you just can't get past it. Uh, this TV could be uh, in the same vein uh, when people and jurors specifically are reviewing the case. Hans writes. Uh, and Tim, this one's for you. My concern is that she cleans up a lot of her awful behavior, vitriol, vitriol toward Dan and deceit on the stand uh, come time for her own trial. She can improve a lot. Carl's already shaking that head. Um, does it even matter at that point if we've got uh, all these points uh, that the state will use uh, that Carl is presenting here uh, against her? Does it matter? Remember, remember now, Georgia didn't call her up to the stand for no reason. She has her under oath. She has her making statements. If she tries to change her statements or change her vitriol, she can cross-examine her with her now showing that only now that you're charged have you gotten your lawyer to prepare what you're going to say. Um, those words can come back to haunt you. She had to testify. She got immunity. Um, she probably didn't want to. She claimed that her mother and father were willing to talk to the police, but no one called them. That's a lie. Um, she claimed that they would come. What would they say? Oh, they'd tell the truth. Really? You think they'd tell the truth? And George's last question is, oh, do they have lawyers? Oh, yeah, they have lawyers. So she's not going to be able to clean up. You know, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. She is what she is. Um, she's a privileged person. She's probably gotten away with a lot of things because of her appearance. She's educated. And I think her family's probably carried her uh, in such a lifestyle that she believes she can do what she wants and have uh, other people do the dirty work. Carl, what's, uh, what's the next point number numero? Um, this one was already mentioned by either, uh, Tim or John, and that has to do with Wendy was the only source to let Katie know that the hit was successful before the hitman called Katie. I mean, that's a real dagger. So that's, that's what, uh, one of the hitmen described, uh, mm-hmm. Louise Rivera, so yep. uh, that Katie had already known about it. That, that, that's just so damning because nobody else, like Tim was saying, would have known about this. So yeah, that, it wasn't on the news. It there. wasn't on the news. By the time that call was made, right. there was no news about right. him being killed and murdered on that street. John Singer, is that the dagger of death? <laughs> that is one of the daggers. There's many. Um, we can debate uh which one is the top and which one but that that's certainly a, a, a very bad one if Rivera is to be believed then um that's a bad one for Wendy by the way everyone if you're enjoying this please hit that like button what I'm amazed at is 
how cool, calm, and composed these three guys are. I'm way too emotional to be an attorney. I'd be screaming and throwing stuff. I think Fancy <laughs> might do the same. Uh, way too emotional. But these guys are uh, excellent point by point here, making their case. And uh, I think we're on to point 15 here, and then we'll get some final thoughts. And uh, we're going to do it again. I'll talk to these guys off camera, and maybe we can make this a weekly uh, thing until we get to the trial because that's how many points Carl has. So, uh, Carl, without further ado, point 15 out of something like 125 and growing points. The uh, this 15th one here, I think, really shows that it wasn't just fleeing the scene there, getting out of Tallahassee, but it also shows that money was a big motive here. And that's the fact that Wendy, within a couple days of Dan's death, is calling up the life insurance, wanting to know what is she able, able to recover from Dan's death. And yet, square this with her testimony that in court, remember she testified this in front of a jury and the, and the judge and everybody, that she was so upset over Dan's death that she couldn't even eat for weeks. And the first time she did, it was with her brother. It wasn't a celebration dinner, but she actually vomited in the restaurant. And so, which is it? You know, I think I think she was eating just fine and they were in the celebratory mood because uh, not only was he gone, but they were making all kinds of money and she did recover this money. It wasn't in her name, as it turns out, but in the boy's name, she's still able to get a whole lot of money monthly, I'm sure, for their uh, care and maintenance. Shout out to Jeannie and Jimmy Castiano becoming YouTube members tonight. Love to see that. Uh, someone just posed the question um tim to you that's a great question why is she wearing the same dress in all the trials when you go to a play doesn't the same actor wear the same outfit (laughs) she has her outfit damn that is the line of the night right there same clothes same bat station wow that's on the list by the way good job tim I just ruined the hook shot by jumping in there, but I couldn't help it. What a great, uh, what a, what a great moment right there. We have made it through 15 of something like 125 points. This will be the longest running show in in YouTube history, only uh, next to Mash on television. Uh, we will be back here. I'm going to get these round these guys up. Uh, John Singer. The quiet spoken man with the best windows in New York City is co-founder of Singer Deutsch LLP, designated a New York super lawyer for a thousand years consecutively, makes regular appearances on CNBC and every other imaginable network and STS, of course. Uh, John, your closing remarks on this night of at least 15 points that could, could get Wendy indicted, possibly um, what are your thoughts on all this? I think that I think the points are excellent, and it's it's been great debating them and sort of hashing out in the pantheon or the hierarchy of of indicia of Wendy's guilt. Where you know what falls where, and and I'm sure as three lawyers, we all have different opinions on on what the strongest point is and what resonates with us the most. But just one overall thought on the case, and I've said this before. Any major trial, whether it was O.J. Simpson or any of the others that have riveted um, folks like us or or even larger swaths of people, there's usually two sides, right? I mean, in the O.J. case, many of us wanted to see him get convicted, and there were many people who wanted to see him get acquitted. The the Adelson case or, or the Markell case, if you will, there's just complete unanimity. Everybody wants all of the Adelsons to go to prison. I think we all have differing opinions on the strength of the evidence against each, but I just, what strikes me is there's unanimity. There's no, there's no deviation as far as perception of desire for what happens to the Adelsons. We all want justice for the Markell family. We all want each and every Adelson to go to prison. We all want the Markell family to get the justice they deserve. And I think, again, that's why we're here. That's why we're obsessed. And that's why you're providing such a service, Joel, to everybody, because you're satiating all of our obsessions together. Thank you, John Singer. I appreciate that. Um, 
The man you are looking at, there was an interesting side chat going on. I guess people think, Tim Jansen, you look like Freddie Couples, the golfer. Everyone's asking me. Um, are you asked that often? I was in a trial, and a judge goes, you know, Tim, you look like Freddie Couples. <laughs> I said, yeah, until I swing a golf club. <laughs> um, but, I have had that before. But I've also been told I look like Governor DeSantis. Um, so... I get a lot of that different looks. <laughs> uh, you're a pretty damn good golfer, too. And the other thing you're good at, I, I haven't said it, but we all know this. Tim Jansen also is a super lawyer. Uh, and also, one thing you should know, um, Tim basically sacrificed his life for this very episode. It was his anniversary, and he left. And hopefully his wife doesn't leave him. And hopefully she doesn't leave him in a Wendy Adelson manner. So... Huge thanks to Tim Jansen for doing this. He is a defense attorney in the firm that bears his name, Jansen and Davis. He also spent five years as a federal prosecutor. No one knows Tallahassee better, and he's one of the finest attorneys and humans you'll meet. Tim, your final thoughts on all this? I think it's great. Uh, I really enjoy talking to other lawyers about the cases because it's it's our craft. It's what we do, um, and it's hard to explain to non-lawyers evidentiary issues. But I, I think it really comes down to one thing. Really, cases are about evidence and common sense. What really happened doesn't make common sense. And sometimes you get in a case and you take, and I saw there was a comment, someone said that I, I, um, I take despicable cases or not uh, popular cases. And I have represented cases that are not popular in the community. But I'm not representing what they did. I'm representing the process. And I'm there to make sure that everyone's entitled to a fair trial. And if the government wins, then they did their job. But if they didn't do their job and my client's not guilty, uh, then I'm going to make sure that they're protected. And I, I've enjoyed doing this. I enjoy, Joel, you're great at this. And I, I hope that I give some information back from my experiences that are helpful to others. You certainly are. Angela Rice, she's giving you advice that you better take, Tim. Happy yeah. anniversary, Tim Jansen. Better buy the wife a diamond tennis bracelet on your way home. He is home. That is the sweetest-looking mahogany den you'll ever see in someone's house, Tallahassee style. Carl Steinbeck, no relation. Well, there is relation to John Steinbeck. That's actually his brother, but not the author, not the Of Mice and Men author. He is a lieutenant colonel, retired, nearly 30-year judge advocate, uh, for the U.S. Army, uh, he has done it all. He also has his own practice, uh, seven years in capacities as an assistant criminal district attorney, state public defender, and private practitioner. And you can see that shining through as he delivers all these points. Uh, we're going to have you back, Carl, obviously, with uh, both Tim and John. Uh, your final thoughts on uh, what you presented here this evening. Uh, just to uh, echo, uh, the, you sort of mentioned this as well, Joel, the details really matter. And what I find is that jurors, random facts, they will they will grab and you may not think of it as a lawyer being significant, but they'll grab some tangential fact that that really sheds a whole light and just blows a whole case wide open to, for them flipping and saying, you know what, that person is guilty. So I think there's a lot of these little nuggets in this case that they're going to they're going to definitely flip. And, and, and if there's any uh, folks that think Wendy is, is just innocent, and all this kind of thing, there's so many little nuggets and, and also big rocks in this case that they're going to they're going to see the light of what this is really about. And I believe that uh, a jury in the end is going to uh, do the same kind of outcome like on the Murdo case. They're, they're going to definitely see this is a is a win for the government. And as they say, time will tell. Uh, I wonder if George is watching this. Uh, she could definitely pick up some great tips. Final comments, Dorothy Jane, love all these guys. How can you not love these guys? Uh, to thank you, Carl, Tim, and John. Thanks much, Joel, and love to Carm. I will say hello to Carm for everybody. And hi, Georgia. How are you? Quick programming <laughs> note. Uh, we will be back live tomorrow evening, 7 p.m. Eastern time. The topic will be Alec Murdoch once again, specifically. Uh, we are still working out the kinks. Friday. 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. It is Detective Phil Waters of Houston PD. Uh, he's a homicide detective. 
has investigated 400 plus homicide cases. We'll talk to him about what's going on the new going on in the news. And then Sunday night live, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Carm on the case. We've been talking about Ellen Greenberg. Uh, she's a young woman that was found dead back in 2011, 27 years old, stabbed 20 times, 10 to the back of the neck and her back. It was ruled a suicide. Something fishy is afoot. We're trying to get justice for Ellen Greenberg and her parents, Sandy and Josh. Justice for Ellen Greenberg. Justice for Dan Markell. Love you, America. Till next time.